Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell, and today we're taking a look at five to eight different short reviews of games. I say five to eight because I'm going to be talking about these two mind bug games and then these three uh, story games, the plot thickens together. Um, so let's get a, taking a look at all of these. Here we go. So I played Mind Bug back when it first came out in 2022 and really enjoyed it. It was like a small Magic the Gathering. And so if you want to know how to play Mind Bug and my thoughts on Mind Bug as a whole, which are very positive, I like it, 8 out of 10, um, you can go check out that review. But here I'm talking about these standalone expansions, uh, Beyond Evolution and Beyond Eternity. Beyond. These can be played by themselves, which is very simple to do with Mind Bug, or you can combine them with Mind Bug. They both add a few minor mechanisms to the point where if you've never played Mind Bug before, you could easily buy one of these and jump into it. I'm just here to show people who've already played Mind Bug a little bit about what's in them. Here we go. So here we have Beyond Eternity, Beyond Evolution, both boxes having enough room to hold both expansions. And if you take the insert out, can hold the original game also. They come with some spinners that you can use to keep track of your life. But, and they also come with the same rule book comes in both of them. All right, so let's take a look at Beyond Evolution first. This is the set that I like better. But that's because I love the Evolve action that you can take here. So this has an action on these cards. And so gain one life and evolve to a Frog Prophet. And then when you evolve, so this one evolves to a Frog Prophet who can gain a life. And evolve to a World Eater. This Waddling Recruit evolves to a Veteran Penguin who evolves to the Frosty Fortress. The Cloudy Lady evolves to the Typhoon Princess, who evolves into Thunder Queen. And Wild Sprout evolves to a Big Root, who then evolves to a Oaken Master. Which gives all your other alley creatures plus five power, which is pretty powerful. So there's other cards with actions. This one's a pretty interesting one to drag it in. If you control fewer creatures than your opponent, they lose a life. This one, defeat this, you can kill yourself to take control of an enemy creature. Choose an enemy creature. They attack with it if possible. Defeat an enemy creature with power seven or more. And then there's all sorts of other cards in here just to kind of round things out. There's Coach Panda. Remember him from high school? The cheeky chimp Borg, steel Borg, and so on and so forth. That's what's in this set. Now, let's take a look at the other set here. Beyond Eternity. Beyond Eternity has cards that when they go in the discard pile, something will happen. So here, allied creatures have minus two power. That's a negative thing. But the guy is a 10 with frenzy and tough. Here, when they're in discard pile, when the opponent loses life, they lose an extra two life. That's crazy. Here, allied creatures are plus one power. Enemy creatures with power seven or more cannot attack or block. So these also have boosting. So when you boost, you're simply taking a card from the discard pile and sticking it underneath the creature to give them plus one attack. Gain a life, boost uh, boost one card to a creature. Boost a card to a creature, return a boost card to your hand. What else we got? Boost a card to a creature, defeat exactly two creatures with equal power. This one, you can boost two cards to this whenever he attacks. There's one here I think that lets you boost four cards. Yeah, this, yes, holiness. Boost four cards to one or more creatures. And then, like I said, with the other one, there's also more creatures to round everything out. Getting vibes of little John and Robin Hood running through the forest. So lots of cool different creatures in here in both of the sets. For me, I love the Beyond Evolution one. I love evolving stuff. I would love it a whole lot more if there was more than four of them. <laughs> there's... I think there's more that you can get through other means and stuff with Mind Bug. There's a lot of Mind Bug cards floating around. I just wish that was a more prevalent thing in here because you could literally play it and never see one, which I think is a bummer, which means I, I would normally be like, I'm nine because I love that so much. But I do like these. I think I like them about the same as original Mind Bug, but I like it a lot because I can mix them together. Knowing that something evolves, knowing that something in a discard pile makes you think even more, is this where I Mind Bug you and steal it? 
There's that in there, and I think it's fun. So these are just like the original one, an 8 out of 10. You can easily combine them and play with them. The Evolution, like I said, I, I like the discard pile. I like the evolving. I like the actions. I like the boosting. It's all easy stuff to do. There's no other keywords, new keywords, all the same keywords in both of them. So if you like the original, get this. If you never played the original, get it. It's a short little two-player game that's a lot of fun. Mind bugs. Beyond eternity and beyond friendship, not beyond evolution. The plot thickens. There's three of them. Sci-fi, romance, and the detective edition. There you have it. These are storytelling games. And I'm going to tell you straight off the bat, if you don't like storytelling games, you can turn the video off. You won't like these. If you do like storytelling games, well, you can probably turn the video off too, because you'll like these. Here's how they play. Each of these games is played the same way. I suppose you could even mix them. This one has um, magnifying glasses. This one has hearts. And this one has spaceships, the sci-fi, romance, and this. You're going to be picking a person who will be a character. So maybe mine, I'll be a cadet that I'll play in front of me. And then you'll decide how many chapters of the game you want to play. And you'll take some thing cards, some place cards, and some person. I have monster trainer, farm, engine room, coupling, and cryo chamber. And then you start the story. So you're going to be playing these cards and giving people information about them in front of you. And you're just telling a story. Anytime you tell this story in the first person, you're like, and I did this, and I did that, and I'm the cadet. Whenever you use a word in your thing, and then I walked into the cryo chamber to see my mother off to her long sleep, you put that card in front of you. And you're just going to keep going. And for each card you played, you get a plot point. You'll take one of these tokens and put it in front of you. So... The goal of the game, says the book, is not to get as many plot points as you can, but to play the cards. You can use other people's plot points. You can put them on other people's cards that they've already played. Then you'll draw back up to five cards and start going again. There's some other things like writer's block, which, you know, if somebody can't figure out what to do, and there's some tips and things. And at the end of the game, whoever has the most plot points in other people's cards is the main character. And the person with the most plot points in their own card is the author. And you can write down the story titles and stuff in the book. But essentially, you're just telling a cooperative story. There's really no winner and no loser. So you, I, you saw some of the sci-fi ones. Like romance has different things. Maybe a billowing shirt, vacation, rainbow fight, campfire, glasses, and so on and so forth. So that's what's in that one. The detective people, we got nurse, son of a rich old man, out of town or priest, black widow, inventor. So that's kind of how these work. It's not really a game. My ranking of these is kind of an experience. I tend to like storytelling games. So I'll give them a six, uh, except for the romance one. I'll give that one a four. I hate romance. I don't hate romance. I love romance, but I hate playing romance. I think real life romance is great. I don't even mind watching a romantic movie. I have no interest in playing a romantic one. Even a sci-fi one's okay. My favorite one of these is detective stories. But it's kind of a shared experience. It's kind of a shared role-playing game. Why would I pick one of these over a role-playing game? I guess you have people, you gotta have people who wanna tell stories. You can see us playing it, probably not well, on the Dice Tower. We played a version of this, and they're fine. It's like, again, I mean, and they look like books, and they're nice quality. Pictures might have helped a little bit, I think. Or at least maybe some faint sketches or something. Eh, eh, eh. There you go. That's <laughs> the plot thickens. You're going to like telling a story or not. So that's how you know if you'll like them or not. Wordcraft. I like word games. And this one is funny, though, because when I open it and you look almost the whole... I'm using the rule book to hold everything in. This is all the components of this game. It could have been in a smaller box, I guess. Or they could have made the components a little better. That's what I would prefer. This is a word game, though, that's mixed with area control. Let me show you. In this game, each there's, it's going to take place over three rounds. You're going to have four objective cards that you place there for the entirety of the game. Then you're also, each round, and there's three rounds, you're going to shuffle and put out two purples, two reds, two blues, three greens, and three yellow cards. And you can see that the cards are kind of by rarity. So the purple cards, you see there's Z and J, but it also could have been V, K, or Q, or Q, U, together. And each player is going to take turns. You're going to start with 18 cubes. And on your turn, you're simply going to make a word. So, for example, let's say I made the word lady. I would say L, there's no A, D, and Y. I put a cube on each of those. Then I see, did I fulfill any of the requirements? 
Did I start with a green letter and end with a red one? I did indeed. Do I have two red letters in my word? No. Was my word four, four, did I put four cubes out? I did not. Did I have a blue and a purple in my word? No. So that's not particularly a good word for me to have done, maybe. I don't know. Um, let's see, what other thing I could do? I could just do the word zoo. And so I put one on Z and two on O's down here. And that gives me one on this card because I did blue and purple. But I didn't get this one and I didn't put out four cubes. And obviously you're gonna think of words better. I'm just kind of thinking of some words at the top of my head. But when someone is down to two or less cubes, you'll finish out the round on turn wise. And then whoever has the most letters on each of these is going to, the most cubes on each of these is gonna get the points, two, three, four, five, or six at the top. Then you reset the letters, you put out two more letters of each, or three of each type, and they could be the same ones. You shuffle them back together, and you play again. You do that three turns. The only difference is you're gonna get three more cubes at it at the end of a turn. So you have, over the course of the game, you will have 24 cubes. And then at the end of the game, you count the number of cubes on each of these, and you get bonus points. You gotta keep the points on a separate sheet of paper, not included in the game. Most points is the winner. I'm sad about my rating of WordCraft. I'll tell you right now, it's a seven out of 10. I like the game, but I really like the game. I'd probably give it an eight or a nine. That's how much I enjoy this game, but the components are that bad. The, I, there's four cards of different things. They're like, sort them out. Why did you make the backs of all the objective cards the same if you want me to sort them out according to type? Then they're like the ones with the blue back. I'm like, there's barely a blue back. And then little cubes. The whole thing doesn't look good, but it plays well. I like this game. You're trying to think of words. And again, having a good lexicon certainly helps. Uh, but as I sit there and I try to attempt to build and spell out words, I'm thinking of different things. I'm thinking of area control on the letters. I'm thinking of completing these objectives. And I played this with some people who were very good at word games, and I edged out the victory. They thought of better words than me, but I was playing strategically so I could control the Q and the J and the different letters on the board, and I got a lot of points that way. So, very, very fun game. No score pad or way to score in the game, and obviously room in the box for that. This is a bummer. This is a game that needs to be picked up by someone who's going to give it love and make it look a lot nicer because it's pretty good. I enjoyed it. Uh, word crap. So if you'd like word games, you like Scrabble, this might be one you want to check out. On the road. So this is in the 60s. You're a band. You're going around and you're touring. You're going to go to the big concert. That's definitely not Woodstock. And you're going to perform there and then uh, and get people to come and see you. And then I looked at the name. Calavini. He's one of the designers. Bubola is the other designer. Coimbra did the art, which is great. But Calavini, he's one of the most abstract designers in existence. He sucks theme out of a game like a vacuum cleaner. But this is such a cool theme. Well, maybe I'll like it. In this game, you have a bag of fans. It starts with three fans of everybody's color. You'll have a van here going down this winding random path. And you'll have three cards from this beautifully illustrated deck. On your turn, you'll play a card. You'll move that many spaces. One, two, three, four. If someone's already on the space you go to, you skip to the next space. If you land on a space that shows terrain type, you take a ticket of that terrain type, and then you look at the number of terrain types that you have of that one. So let's say I landed here and already had one, and I would throw two fans into the bag. If you land on a van space, you can your next turn, you can decide to go forward, backwards, or forward, double your movement card. And if you land in a city, you're gonna have a fan where you pull people from the bag. So you're gonna pull basically equal to the number of notes in front of you. You'll get notes when you land on van piles. And whenever you pull from the bag, if you pull your color, well, that's exciting. They go up here. And if you pull other people's color, they go to the porta potty. And you're gonna keep doing that until you get to the end. When you get to the end, you'll take one of these tiles in front of you, which is going to, well, you'll take the biggest one if you're the first one there. And that's all you'll do for the rest of the game is just pull tiles from the bag or things from the bag. At the end of the game, whoever has the most stars here is going to be the winner. There's a few things you can do by spending different ticket locations that you have gotten. You can spend two of them to take all, to take all the drawn fans of your color to the bag when someone else pulls them out instead of putting them on the porta potty. Or there's a couple other things to do. When someone else draws fans, you can go 
the four different ones to place one of the fans on the main stage tile instead of the porta potty tile. So there's things you can do by discarding them, but if you discard them, you'll get fewer tokens in the bag. Anyway, blah, 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 someone wins. I hate it. Three out of 10. I really hate this game. This is, I mean, nice art. The game does what it's supposed to do. It's so mind-numbingly boring. You have three movement cards in your hand. You pick which one you're gonna move to. You know how many times you're gonna have two of the same number? A lot. So you have two choices. I'm gonna go here or here. I go there, I throw someone in the bag. And then you pull from the bag, but it's random what you pull. You can be like, well, you should get more of your stuff in the bag. No kidding, that's what everyone's doing. There's no, there's nothing here. You, you, can, you can be like, or you could rush to the end to get, draw more from the bag, but you're not throwing more in the... Man, this is so terrible. Those little tickets that you get when you go and do things, there's only so many of those, so eventually they run out, and that gets boring. You throw a bunch in the bag. There's those special powers, which for some reason are not in a card anywhere. You just have to, well, they're on a the card, but they're, the card, I actually have the card right here. The card, I'm like, I don't know what this means. It's just a bunch of symbols. They're the most interesting part of the game. It has nothing to do with music. It's moving along a track. It feels like some of his other moving along a track games that Calvini has done, but not in a good way. This is just awful. I like bag games where you pull stuff out of bags. I like games where you move down a path and see how far you want to move, but I want some games with some agency, some choice. This one, mind-numbing, boring, bad, on the road. Hey, look, Words of a Feather has a hole in the box so you can hang it on the wall. I feel like that's a little pretentious to start off the bat there. Because, I mean, are you saying this artwork is so good I'm going to want to hang it on my wall? It's big, heavy box. It's been done with a board game before, Canvas. But Canvas was cute, and it was also the theme of this game. This game is about, well, it's a word-based game. And it uses peacock feathers on here. And, uh, well, it's not a good game. But I'll show it to you anyway. In this game, you'll build this big peacock in the middle with an ashtray here in the middle. With some tokens. People are going to start with some tokens. And... You also start with a hand of cards. I think they're different colors because uh, who knows? Anyhow, you'll look at your cards and on your turn, you will pick two of them. So let's say I pick season and Eve, and then I give you one more clue verbally. So I'll say holiday. So you're trying to think of what my secret word is and everyone will write it down on their little whiteboards. So the three clues are season, Eve, and holiday. And the word is Christmas. Before we show the words, People can bet if they're going to match anybody else. You can double your bet. You can bet one or two gems and get some extra gems. And then the person who gives the clue will get a point for each person matching them. And everyone else gets a point as long as you match one other player. And then once someone gets to a certain number of points, depending on the number of players, if it's 15 or 20, the game will end mercifully. Folks, this is the definition of a bad party game. Four out of ten. Um, maybe if you need an ashtray or something, it's so easy to get people to guess words. If you could pick two of your words and then you can pick any other word in existence to tie them together, everyone guessing your word gives you a point. And the problem with this game is that there's no, there's no incentive to not get everyone to guess your word. So if you're playing with eight people, I'm going to get eight points. And the whole betting on if you'll match someone else or not, you might as well bet every turn. Who cares? There's no... There's no, this feels like a half-baked par party game. And I want to be clear, it is a half-baked party game. The cards are peacock feathers. Why? Because they wanted to use the title Words of a Feather. That's why. There's no other reason. The cards aren't very well picked for the words. It's just someone went and picked up a bunch of a lot of words. The components aren't that great. The box is big and bulky for no reason at all. And it's just not great. What's the catch? Give clues, have people guess. There's like a billion games that do that, but they, you need a hook. I want everyone to guess it but one. I want to be a little bit more cryptic in my clue giving. That's a hook. This game doesn't have it. You just look at two of your feathers and pick in a third word and have people guess it. And because of the way scoring works, these games end really quickly, which is fine because, yeah, you're done with the game, but that's not how you want a party game to be over that fast. Oh, you won? Okay, well, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Words of a feather. Can't really recommend it. Four out of ten. So there you go, folks. Not a lot of positivity on some of these games, but like I said, very interesting word game. And of course, Mindbug, good as always. And maybe you want to tell some stories. But there you go. 
Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, I'm Tom Basil, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.